So when I spoke on uh, the Apocrypha a few weeks ago, I ran out of time. So this is going to be a brief recap and just to cover the sections that I couldn't get through. So I mentioned that the English word cannon, not the same as a cannon that you shoot, that's got two ends. It comes from the Latin and indirectly from the Greek. And even the Hebrew word is, is very similar. And in all those languages, the word signifies a reed or a unit of measurement. And so when we're talking about canon in terms of the scripture, we're talking about a set of books which have been measured and regarded as authoritative scripture by a religious group. So if I say uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four canonical gospels, I mean they belong in scripture, and there are other books that do not belong in scripture. The word apocrypha we saw originally meant hidden writings. But it came to be commonly applied to, to writings that were of questionable value. And we typically apply to any scriptural texts that are outside of the canon. So if we say that work is apocryphal, generally Protestants mean that it doesn't belong in the Bible. Now, although the word apocrypha meant hidden, it later came to mean worse. Things that were even theologically suspicious or heretical. And we don't use it always in that sense. So there are some works that are um, apocryphal. When we talk about the books that the Catholics and the Orthodox consider as deuterocanon, it, it's slightly different uh, to certain apocryphal works. There are some apocryphal works that are outright heretical. When we're talking about those works, we believe they've got some value, but that they shouldn't be in the canon of Scripture. And so the term apocrypha has different meanings depending on whether you're Protestant, a Catholic, or Eastern Orthodox, or Ethiopian Orthodox. So there are books we saw that are called deuterocanonical, uh, secondary canon by Catholics and Orthodox, but we call them apocryphal. And typically those books are the books of Tobit, Judith, 1 and 2 Maccabees, the Book of Wisdom, Sirach, also called Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, uh, the letter of Jeremiah, and also the additions to both Daniel and Esther. Uh, in the Catholic Deuterocanon, it will be in their Bible, but if Protestants do put it in a Bible, they put it in a sec uh, separate section called Apocrypha. When you hear the term pseudepigraphical, that means a book where the author is claiming to be someone that they're not. So it might be the Gospel of Thomas or something like that, or uh, where it gives the appearance that it's written by someone who is an important figure in the Bible, but actually it's written by someone else. So just a reminder, there we see on the left-hand side, the Protestant Old Testament and the Jewish Tanakh are identical in content. We, we know that the books are grouped differently in the Tanakh, and sometimes they have books grouped together, uh, leading to a lower count where they have 24 books we have got 39 books, but they are identical uh, in all other respects. Okay, but the Catholic Bible adds the books that I just mentioned now. Tobit, Sirach, all the way up to the additions to Esther. There you can see the language that they're written in. Typically, the Greek ones are written later. As Alexander conquered the known world, people started speaking Greek more and more. So that's a pretty good indicator of the age of a book by the way, which is one of the reasons, you know, why I don't believe in the late date of Daniel, is that Daniel's written in Hebrew and Aramaic, which immediately tells you it's an earlier book. And then we looked at why Protestants don't consider the Apocrypha to be canonical. And just in summary, we noted that the Apocrypha was never cited by Jesus or the apostles we saw that it was never part of the Jewish canon. The idea that it was part of a larger Jewish Alexandrian canon and then removed later 
is something that's totally fabricated. We also saw that there are, there are certain doctrinal issues. And in certain cases, there are irreconcilable historical errors in these books as well. I also pointed out that there's no evidence that the deuterocanonical books were ready in the Septuagint at the time of Christ. So one of the arguments is, but those books were in the Septuagint. They are in the Septuagint that we found, but the earlier Septuagints we found are from the 4th century AD. So that's hardly an argument to try to prove that they were in uh, the Bible at the time of Christ, when you've got something that's 400 years later. And if they were in the Bible at the time of Christ, it seems interesting that Jesus and the apostles never ever quote from them and don't even mention them, or that there's not even a debate about them. We find that Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, debated about a lot of things, but you never find them arguing about whether Maccabees should be in the Bible or not. Uh, it's just a non-issue because I don't believe it was in the Jewish canon. We saw that Josephus, who lived um, in the first century AD, referred only to 22 books due to a slightly different grouping being in the Jewish canon. And I pointed out that not only Josephus, that Philo, who lived in Alexandria, know nothing about the supposed Greek Alexandrian canon. Well, I'm telling you about that. You'll find a lot of Christian articles as well, where they say there were two canons and these ones were removed, and they talk about the, the Jewish canon and the Alexandrian canon, all the canon from Antioch. This stuff is fabricated. It's based on evidence that centuries after the fact. They talk about a council they had in Jamnia when there's absolutely no evidence of that as well. We supposedly in the late first century, the Jews chucked certain books out of the Bible and then finalized their canon. Their canon was finalized hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene. Okay, now while some of the early leaders of the church accepted some of the books uh, of Apocrypha Scripture, most did not. We saw that even Jerome, who was the man who translated the Bible uh, into Latin, he translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Latin and the New Testament from Greek into Latin, a very uh, well-known version called the Vulgate. In fact, it was the standard uh, Bible of the church for a thousand years, much longer than the King James has been a, been a standard English version. And the very man who put uh, you know, the Vulgate together did not think that those books belonged in the Old Testament. He considered them as books that could be read for edification as opposed to canonical books, which were used to establish doctrine. I even pointed out how he only translated two of them until he uh, realized that they weren't part of the Hebrew canon, and then he stopped translating them. So when you get those books, even Maccabees in the Vulgate, they're not Jerome's translation. They were taken from an old um, translation, an old Latin translation, which wasn't as good as Jerome's translation. We also noted that before the Reformation, even the Catholic scholars didn't agree that these books were scripture. And this is an excerpt from the Catholic Encyclopedia, not a Protestant article. They say in the Latin church, so they're talking about the a Western church as opposed to the Orthodox uh, in the East, all through the Middle Ages, we find evidence of hesitation about the character of the deuterocanonicals. Those are the books we're talking about. They say there is a current friendly to them, another one distinctly unfavorable to their authority and sacredness. And they actually go on to say that even Thomas Aquinas was you know, not convinced of their exact standing. And Thomas Aquinas, if you don't know, was the greatest Catholic theologian of the medieval time. And they say few are found to unequivocally acknowledge their canonicity. So there were very few Catholics before the Reformation who were convinced that those deuterocanonical books should be in Scripture. We did see that there were councils at Hippo and Carthage, regional councils that listed them as canonical, but it was not the official view of the uh, Catholic Church. And in fact, it only became official 
um, the official view in the 16th century, century at the Council of Trent, and it was in response to the Reformation and to the fact that they were battling to argue against guys like Martin Luther, things like purgatory, which could only get some sort of a minimal support from a book like Second Maccabees, and because he questioned the authority, they had to try and make them a bit more authoritative. And so we saw that in his disputa uh, disputation with Eck at Leipzig in 1519, when his opponent urged the well-known text from two Maccabees in proof of the doctrine of purgatory, Luther replied that the passage had no binding authority since the book was outside the canon. That's exactly what Jerome had said, who translated the Vulgate. He said those books were fine to read, but they couldn't be used to establish doctrine. In the first edition of Luther's Bible in 1534, when he translated it into German, the Deuteros were relegated as Apocrypha to a separate place between the two Testaments. So he put them in a separate section. And normally in Protestant Bibles where they have been included, they've been put in a separate section. Whereas if you get a Catholic Bible, you'll find that they interspersed among the other Old Testament books. So the response of the Catholic Church was to have a Council of Trent, and they uh, would say that those books were now scripture. They were deuterocanon, canon, part of a second canon. And the only, well, they didn't follow Jerome uh, because Jerome, who had produced their Latin Bible, as I pointed out, uh, was not convinced that those books well, he didn't believe they were canonical and didn't believe they could be used to establish doctrine. Augustine was in favor of them. And it certainly seems that the reason that they decided to make them deuterocanon was in response to certain doctrines that they could use, which the Protestants were questioning, and they wanted something more authoritative, such as the doctrines in particular were purgatory, praying for the dead, the treasury of merit, So what was the process that they used at the Council of Trent for deciding whether a thing was canonical, besides counteracting Luther? And by the Catholic Encyclopedia's own admission, the criteria was tradition. Earlier on, when they decided should a thing be in the Bible, their criteria was, for example, in the Old Testament, was it you know, written by a prophet? In the New Testament, was it written by an apostle or by a companion of apostle, um, et cetera, et cetera? Um, you don't find those kind of requirements that they used. And so this is again from a Catholic website. They say the Council of Trent did not enter into an examination of the fluctuations in the history of the canon. Because if they had, they would have known that even the Catholics weren't agreed on whether they should be in the Bible or not. They say neither did it trouble itself about questions of authorship. That's interesting. That was normally a major criteria. Or character of contents. True to the practical genius, they claim, of the Latin church, it based its decision on immemorial tradition as manifested in the decrees of previous councils and popes. Okay, so they, by their own admission, didn't look at authorship, didn't look at content, they just looked at tradition, which is also surprising because if you look at the tradition, the tradition is very divided and even the author of their own official Bible said they shouldn't be regarded as scripture. But the Council of Trent rejected several books which are accepted by the Orthodox Church, namely 1 and 2 Esdras, the letter of Jeremiah, the prayer of Manasseh, and 3 and 4 Maccabees. That's interesting because now it shows you the real criteria because 2nd Esdras, or some people call it 4th Esdras, contains a strong objection against prayers for the dead. And remember, that's one of the reasons they were trying to pull in 2nd Maccabees, because there's a bit there about praying for the dead. But they rejected 2nd Esdras because it has an objection to prayers to the dead. 2nd Esdras also mentions that the Old Testament canon is 24 books. So they didn't want that one in the Bible because it specifically says the, uh, the canon's only 24 books, and they were trying to make the canon bigger and exclude the Apocrypha. And so the Dewey Rames Bible, which is around about the time of the King James, a little bit earlier, the Catholics finally sort of gave in when they realized that 
people wanted a Bible in the common language and Tyndall had gone ahead and even though for his troubles he was strangled and burnt at the stake, he still managed to get an English Bible out. So reluctantly, the Catholics allowed a, an approved translation of the Bible into English. They didn't first translate it from the Greek and the Hebrew, though they translated it from the Latin. And so that Dewey Rames Bible, the first edition, 1582, was translated from the Latin Vulgate. So it's a translation of a translation. And in this version, the books of the Apocrypha are mixed with the other books rather than put separately like Luther would do. Now, other Catholic approved translations, which got a 73 book canon, remember we use a, 63, a 66 book canon, are um, the Dewey Rames uh, Shalona Revision, the Confraternity Bible, the Knox Bible. These are just well known ones. And I'll just get to the more modern ones, the Jerusalem Bible of 1966, the New American Bible. So if you come across Bibles like those, those are Catholic Bibles, which will include the Apocrypha and not in a separate section either. And there's a whole other list of Catholic Bibles as well. What you might not know is that the Living Bible, which many people use, also has a Catholic edition. So does the New Revised Standard Version. I put them in red. The Good News translation as well, Revised Standard Version. The NLT, a lot of people like it. I don't particularly like it. It used to be the Living Bible. It's too much of a paraphrase for me. I don't believe it should be called a translation. They also have a Catholic edition. And even the ESV, I was surprised because I like the ESV. They've also got a Catholic edition. So uh, be aware that those Bibles in red are both Protestant uh, versions and Catholic versions, obviously because you sell more if you have both. <laughs> and despite the fact that people criticize the NIV, there's no Catholic edition, by the way. <laughs> A lot of people like to criticize the NIV and they call it the nearly inspired version. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the Orthodox canon. There's a slightly different set of books uh, in the Orthodox uh, Bibles. So it's good to be aware of these, although we are more familiar with the debate that exists between Protestants and Catholics. But in fact, the Orthodox don't have a formal canon. They haven't had a council like the Catholics did uh, at Trent and issued some sort of formal proclamation. And in fact, there's slight variations between the Greek Septuagint. Obviously, they use it because they speak Greek. The Syriac Peshitta, the Slavonic, Georgian, and Ethiopian Bibles. The Orthodox Church add to their list the prayer of Manasseh, 1 Esdras, 3 Maccabees, and Psalm 151. And there's differences as well. Uh, the Ethiopians have a very loose definition of, of the canon. And it's easiest to show in, um, in a graph format. So we see that the Catholics along with the Eastern Orthodox and the Ethiopian Orthodox, so that they call themselves a Coptic church, all agree on those books that I've got at the top. But the Eastern Orthodox will add three and four Maccabees. And the Ethiopian uh, Orthodox have books one to three. You can see it's similar the spelling to Maccabees, but in fact, the contents are quite different. But you can see yeah, what I mean, that the Eastern Orthodox have got quite a few books uh, that aren't in the Catholic Bible, and the Ethiopian Orthodox, as I say, just because their definition of canon is a lot looser. So you get books like two Baruch Odes, some extra Psalms, the Prayer of Manasseh, Psalms of Solomon, and then you'll see the Ethiopians add Enoch. The book of Enoch is a very well-known one, and Jubilees. In fact, to be honest, I actually quite like the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, even though I don't regard them as scripture. They are very useful. So that's a good example of books that are apocryphal, not part of scripture, but where they're very useful. One Maccabees is the same, in my opinion not heretical books, out like heretical. You might find it now and there something you don't agree with, and hence we don't consider them scripture, but they're not blatant heresy. Just to give you a very brief overview of some of these books, The Martyrdom of Isaiah, 
describes the way in which Isaiah uh, allegedly met his death at the hands of the wicked king Manasseh by being sawn in two. And we know that that was a strong Jewish tradition. It's alluded to in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about some who were sawn asunder. The book of Jubilees, as I pointed out, uh, is a book that I, I like. It's a very ancient commentary, either from the second or third century before Jesus, a Jewish commentary on the book of Genesis and Exodus, and a lot of interesting things in there. And it was well known to early Christians. It's was quoted by many of them, like Justin Martyr and Oregon and um, Diodorus of Tarsus, and it was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The book of Enoch, very interesting, it contains unique material on why some angels fell from heaven and about the origins of the giants and the demons, and um, as well as prophetic exposition on the future future millennial reign of the son of man specifically uses a term the term that we see used in daniel about the son of man and i think skeptics would have loved for it to have been proven to be after the christian era but it's actually um people will date it to the second and third century before christ and yet it speaks about the son of man the messiah also found in Qumran as well now, the book of Enoch, just to tell you a bit about that, it does appear to be a compilation. I personally believe that the oldest part actually was written by Enoch. Why? Because Jude, Jude says it was. So if we don't believe it was, then we've got to say, well, Jude, got, which is a canonical book, got his facts wrong. Because Jude says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, said. So he quotes that passage, which comes from the book of Watches, as being spoken by Enoch itself. There are other parts which do appear to be written later, so it's, it seems like it was put together by some sort of an editor who combined the different books, but the, the, the first book, which actually contains a lot of interesting information about pre-flood conditions and about the watches, the angels that came and intermarried with women, um, I believe the, the author was, was Enoch. not considered canonical by the Jews, apart from Beta Israel, which are Ethiopian Jews. And likewise, Christians don't consider it canonical besides the Ethiopians as well. So both the Ethiopian Jews and the Ethiopian Christians consider the book of Enoch canonical. Uh, several fragments of the earliest section was found at the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's what I find interesting. That's the earliest section that was found at, uh, at the Dead Sea and was considered uh, very important by the Qumran community. Many of the early church writers quoted it, including Justin Martyr, again Clement of Alexandria, Irenaeus, so a lot of reputable Christian writers quoted from it. They didn't necessarily believe it was scripture, but they did believe that it had value. Oregon, for example, quotes the book of Enoch, but he distinguishes it from holy scripture. And in his rebuttal of uh, Celsus, who's a pagan philosopher and a critic of Christianity, he makes it clear that the various books of Enoch were not considered divine. Because Celsus was a bit uninformed and he was trying to give arguments against Christianity by, you know, quoting Enoch. Does the Apocrypha have any value? Should Christians, Protestant Christians, bother to read it? Bearing in mind we have different apocrypha now. I've told you there's some in the Catholic Deuterocanon, Canon, there's extra ones in the Orthodox ones, and even more ones in the Ethiopian ones. I can tell you that all the ones that are included in Bible, Bibles generally aren't bad to read, even when we don't consider them canonical. There is apocrypha that I'm going to show you later on that is total rubbish and heretical, and I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole unless you're doing it for research on Gnostic cults. It was never accepted as inspired scripture by Protestants, although some found use for it. And I'm not going to read all of these to you, but these are very early um, Protestant confessions. The first one is the Belgic Confession, where we find pretty much the same in all of these, where they're saying that these books have got value, but they don't have the authority of scripture. Same with the 39 articles as well does not apply them to establish any doctrine, but they're not worthless. And pretty much the same with the Westminster Confession of Faith, 
which is used within the Presbyterian tradition. Uh, pretty much the same thing. No authority in the church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. Now, Athanasius, who was a very early um, church writer, he was famous for defending the doctrine of the Trinity. He lived in, in Egypt and he defended uh, the doctrine of the Trinity against the heretic called Arius. He indicates that the deuterocanonical and even some apocryphal books were considered to have value, but not the same authority as scripture. And he specifically mentions there the wisdom of Solomon, which is in the Catholic Bible, the wisdom of Sirach, remember that's Ecclesiasticus, um, Esther and Judith and Tobit, interestingly includes Esther in there, or it could be the additions to Esther. And... Um, he says, the former, my brethren, are included in the canon. The latter, those ones he's just mentioned, merely being merely read. So he's saying you can read them, but they're not in the canon. I've told you about Jerome's point of view, and Jerome was a, a very early Catholic uh, who produced the Latin Bible. Thought they had value. In his preface to the Apocrypha, he said, these are books that although not esteemed like the Holy Scriptures, are still both useful and good to read. So he's not saying they're useless. And pretty much um, the same was said by Martin Luther. He adopted the stance of Jerome. And so he said, uh, remember I told you, he put them in a separate section, distinguished them from Scripture, but he said Apocrypha, that is, books which are not considered equal to the Holy Scriptures, but are useful and good to read. Many people, especially those who are King James only, don't realize that the original King James had the Apocrypha in it. In fact, it had the Apocrypha in it until 1885, so that's why I always laugh when you get these sites where these guys say, you know, talk about, um, you know, modern Bibles being a Catholic conspiracy and I only read the King James. Well, the original King James had the Apocrypha in it for about 200 years. And there I've actually got a, a copy of the six, uh, 1611 King James and there you can see the Apocrypha is in it. And um, it was put in a separate section, but it was only removed from the KJV in 1885 when the English Revised Version was printed. So the Apocrypha was initially kept in a lot of Protestant Bibles in a separate section. Don Stewart, who's a Protestant apologist, he says, the fact that the Apocrypha is not considered to be Holy Scripture does not mean that it is entirely worthless. The books do have some value. For example, and yeah, I agree with him, the book of 1 Maccabees has some valuable historical references about the period between the Testaments. Very interesting. Gives a lot of insight into the time of the Greek rule and into uh, the origin of um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, etc., etc. However, any value these books do have are as historical works, not divinely inspired scripture. So what I'm telling you, if you read the book of Maccabees, you're not going to go to hell, okay? But it's not scripture. Again, while the book of Enoch is not in the Christian canon, unless you're an uh, Ethiopian Coptic uh, Christian, Jude actually quotes from it directly, and Peter alludes to it. So the well-known passage, Jude 14 to 15, where he says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands, of his holy ones to judge everyone. That is a direct quote, quote from Enoch 2 verse 1. Behold, he comes with ten thousands of his sons to execute judgment upon them. So Jude, the brother of Jesus, the author of a canonical epistle, didn't have any problems with uh, quoting a passage from the book of Enoch. And he attributed it to Enoch. Most people will tell you it was written by someone else. Pseudepigraphical. Both Jude and Peter allude to some content which appears to have originated in one Enoch. I go into a lot of detail of this in my book regarding angels who sinned at the time of Noah. They did not get that information from the book of Genesis. 
Because if you read Genesis chapter 6, it doesn't talk about the punishment of the angels. It doesn't talk about them being chained in darkness. And yet Peter and Jude talk about that, about angels who wait in judgment, chained in darkness. They got that from the book of Enoch. The book itself asserts that its author was Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, who lived before the biblical flood. And as I pointed out, I believe the book is, well, most people believe the book is a compilation, and I agree with that. And I think that the parts two to five are pseudepigraphic, that they might have been written by someone else, but that the oldest part was definitely written by Enoch on the authority of Scripture itself, because Jude quotes it and attributes that part to Enoch. So why does... Jude quote a book that we don't consider scripture. Well, if you bear in mind, Paul quoted Greek poets in Acts 17. It doesn't mean that he considered their writings part of scripture. He, when he's speaking in Athens, he says, as some of your own poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. And um, he's actually taking from a poem, which is exalting Zeus, to be, uh, but doesn't mean that he considered it as being inspired uh, canonical uh, scripture. And in the same way, uh, you'll find that people may preach today and quote from a, a news article. It doesn't mean that we believe that it's inspired scripture. And so like um, uh, the take Dr. Michael Hauser gives um, on the significance that writings that Enoch and Jubilees held to biblical authors, bearing in mind that a lot of the early church writers quoted these books. He says this, just as preachers today quote commentaries, journals, news periodicals, or even television shows to drive home or illustrate a point. So the biblical writers used external material to draw attention and make a statement. The psalmists and prophets borrow vocabulary and paraphrase material from ancient Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Syrian literature. And he's an authority in that area on ancient Semitic um, literature. He says the people of biblical times knew the quoted material wasn't inspired, but it had meaning for them and their audience. So we shouldn't get all disturbed by the fact that Jude quoted from the book of Enoch and yet we don't have it in our Bible. In the same way that we're not disturbed by Paul quoting from, you know, Greek poets who aren't part of scripture. So this last section, the New Testament Apocrypha, this, um, you'll find there are a few books once again, which I'll mentioned to you which have some value that were quoted by the early church writers but in this category there's a lot of books here which are outright heresy so when i tell you there's not a problem with reading apocrypha I'm, i've told you the books generally that i've listed there the, or the ones that are in the orthodox um, extended canon that may have some value it's not the same when it comes to a lot of these books the nice thing about the New Testament is that Christians are generally agreed. So Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, when it comes to the New Testament, everybody has the 27 book uh, canon. And that is something that there's not much debate about. But there were certain books that um, were quoted, as I said, by early Christian writers, which were believed to have some value and yet weren't included in the New Testament. And so typically you'll find uh, books like the Epistle of Barnabas. It's attributed to Barnabas, the companion of Paul. There's a debate as to whether it was or not, but the Apostolic Fathers do quote from it. The Didache is attributed to be a work of the Apostles. Once again, that's questionable. The Shepherd of Hermas, these are all books that were held in fairly high regard, but when it came to the crunch, the, you know, the decision was that they didn't belong in Scripture. But as I say, they again, they've got some merit. They're not outright nonsense. But the pseudepigrapha um, category also includes a lot of false Gnostic Gospels, which have fanciful and legendary, legendary stories about the childhood of Christ and the activities of apostles. And so when you get to this period about the second to the 
second, third, and even fourth century AD, there was a lot of these cults, which we call Gnostic. It wasn't a single group. So that's a very broad category. But they produced false writings um, in this period, second, third, fourth century. And to try to give their writings more um, authority, they would say, well, it was written by Thomas or, you know, <laughs> Barnabas or whatever. So it would sound more important than it actually was. So a well-known Gnostic apocryphal book is the Gospel of Thomas. Actually, I think the Gospel of Thomas, the author doesn't even claim to be Thomas. They just call it the Gospel of Thomas because it mentions him. Uh, it originated in the second to the third century, and it was written in Coptic. Coptic was a language that was spoken in Egypt and found in the Egyptian town of Nagamadi in 1945. A lot of books were found in 1945 at Nagamadi, and I can tell you most of them are heretical, Gnostic books. Interestingly, a lot of them are actually, uh, these uh, people, uh, these works are uh, you know, referred to by guys like Irenaeus, an early Christian writer in the second century, who was aware of a lot of these groups, and it's given a lot of more respect to Irenaeus that he mentions a lot of these, these groups that produced these works. And um, so uh, there that, that were 45 ancient texts written in Coptic and dating from uh, the 4th century, but they believe to have been translated from works that may have been as early as the 2nd century. They were sealed in jars buried by a small Gnostic group which had a monastery on the site. These works are pseudepigrapha. They're written too late to be the writings of the claimed authors. And these false claims of authorship were made to try to extend credibility and apostolic authority to the writings. Today, we call that fraud and forgery. If I write something and say, uh, you know, I, the author, Abraham Lincoln, and, you know, writing this, people say he's a fraud. These are heretical um, writings. So you'll find Gnostic Gospels like the Gospel of Judas, Mary, Philip, the Gospel of Truth, etc., etc. I'm not going to read them all off to you. You've got the material if you want to refer to it. And other Gospels, the one of Martian, um, we don't have it today, but it, it appears that he had a butchered copy of Luke. He didn't like the Jews. He believed that the God of the Old Testament was different to the God of the New Testament. So any reference to the Jews or, or Jesus being Jewish, he kind of just cut out of his gospel and had his own little gospel that he used. And a lot of these infancy gospels, a lot of apocalypses, the apocalypse of Paul, the apocalypse of Peter, some epistles, some acts, acts of Andrew, acts of Barnabas and miscellaneous there. As I say, you can see there's quite a lot of them. These guys were pro quite prolific in writing stuff that they wanted people to think was scripture. Irenaeus mentioned that in the second century, a Gnostic sect claimed to have more gospels than the four canonical ones. So you'll get these people who come up with all these wonderful things. The Da Vinci Code was, you know, a famous one where they try to claim that there was a whole lot of gospels. And of course, Constantine, you know, is the boogeyman of all these heresies, you know, who decided only four should be in there. A lot of rubbish. The reason the four gospels were in there is because they were written in the first century. And Irenaeus makes it quite clear that there were four uh, canonical gospels. And he says those, these gospels, are from Valentinus. He was a Gnostic um, a leader. Um, he says, on the other hand, altogether reckless, while they put forth their own compositions, boast that they possess more gospels than they really are. And so he talks about this gospel of truth, which again, we've actually found. And he says, though it agree, agrees in nothing with the gospels of the apostles, so that they really have no gospel, which is not full of blasphemy. I won't read that whole excerpt to you for the sake of time. And so while there is near universal acceptance of the four canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, by the mid-second century, None of the non-canonical Gospels were even close in date of composition, breadth of distribution, or proportion of acceptance. And so the Gospels, inverted commas from Nagamadi, are, are all Gnostic heretical writings that they were not even considered when the canon of Scripture was formed. Oregon, one of the Christian writers in the third century, says, I know a certain Gospel, which is called the Gospel according to Thomas, 
and a gospel according to Matthias, and many others have we read, lest we should in any way be considered ignorant because of those who imagine they possess some knowledge if they are acquainted with these. So they had these Gnostics coming along and pretending they had access to secret information because they had additional gospels. He says, nevertheless, among all these, we have approved solely what the church has recognized, which is that only the four gospels should be accepted. And Irenaeus said the same in the, se uh, the second century. So these guys have come along and tell you that it all happened at the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century by Constantine clearly don't know what they're talking about, or they appeal to the ignorance of people. Um, Gnosticism is popular with some feminists because they try to claim that they have this concept of the divine feminine, and you know that the Christians are patriarchal and oppressed females for years. This is the kind of rubbish you'll find in the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. This is what he says. He says, Jesus was the original feminist. He intended for the future of his church to be in the hands of Mary Magdalene. And he got that idea from the Gnostic Gospel of Mary. But he selectively quotes from these fraudulent books when it suits his theory, and he uses what we call proof by exception. So he kind of like tries to prove something only when they disagree with, um, you know, the Christian sources. Because the Gospel of Thomas actually says, the disciples said to Jesus, we know that you're going to leave us. Who will be our leader? Jesus said to them, no matter where you are, uh, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the just, that's Jesus' brother, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Okay, that's the kind of stuff you get in there. Nothing about Mary Magdalene being the intended leader of the church. What I found interesting when I was researching uh, that material is these people who claim that the Gnostic gospel are pro-feminist, well, Again, they quote selectively. This is from the Gospel of Thomas, a Gnostic Gospel. Simon Peter said to them, Make Mary leave us, for females don't deserve life. Jesus said, Look, I will guide her to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a kind of rubbish that you get in these. But when these guys try to quote from them, they take selective little passages which sound almost, you know, um, intelligent and they quote them. They don't quote them. If you go read the Gospel of Thomas, you'll get a good couple of laughs. The Gnostic Gospel, according to the Egyptians, as Jesus said, I came to destroy the works of the female. So anybody try to tell you about the divine feminine? Well, I'll point them to those points, uh, you know, passages. Uh, notably, the Jesus of many Gospels, these are these Gnostic Gospels, lacks the character of the Jesus in our first century Gospels. So, for example, you find that in the infancy story of Thomas, Jesus strikes dead a boy who bumped him. But apparently, Jesus did this when he was a boy. Some boy bumped him, and so he struck him dead. When the deceased boy's parents complained to Joseph, Jesus strikes him blind. Does that sound like Jesus to you? When another observer complains because Jesus made clay sparrows on the Sabbath, Jesus claps his hands and the birds fly off. Well, the canonical book of John was written by someone who was Jesus' best friend, said that Jesus' first miracle he performed at Cana of Galilee. He wasn't making little clay birds into real birds when he was a boy or striking boys dead who bumped him accidentally. And as I said, if you go read the book of Thomas, you'll find certain parts are totally incoherent. If you read it and you just compare it to, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll, you'll see what was supposedly hidden from us. And I think you'll get a better idea as to why no one even considered it worthy of, um, you know, not only including it in the Bible, nobody bothered to copy them. That's why they had to dig them up hundreds of years later, because no one was bothered to copy such rubbish. I'll give you some excerpts, some gems from the Gospel of Thomas, my own personal favorite. Try to see if you can tell me what these passages mean. Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat so that the lion becomes human. And foul is the human that the lion will eat and the lion still will become human. Does that make sense to you? Me neither. <laughs> Jesus said, whoever has come to understand the world has found only a corpse. 
and whoever has found a corpse is superior to the world. Well, that's handy information to know. Jesus apparently also said, the dead are not alive and the living will not die. During the days when you ate what is dead, you made it come alive. When you are in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you became two, what will you do? Imagine preaching from a, a gospel like that to make quite an interesting sermon. <laughs> There's another couple, as I say. Um, Jesus said, congratulations to the one who came into being before be, be, uh, coming into being. If you become my disciples and pay attention to my sayings, these stones will serve you. And I'd like to just tell you these very clear instructions, which apparently the church hid from us for years, where Jesus tells you on how to enter the kingdom. If you didn't know before, well, now you know it was hidden from you. Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, when you make male and female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, nor the female be female, when you make eyes in the place of an eye, a hand in place of a hand, a foot in place of a foot, an image in place of the image, then you will enter the kingdom. Well, there you know. Now you know how to enter the kingdom. And here are some favorites you could use for nudist colonies, also from the Gospel of Thomas. Mary said to Jesus, what are your disciples like? He said, they are like little children living in a field that is not theirs. When the owners of the field come, they will say, give us back our field. They will take off their clothes in front of them in order to give it back to them, and they return the field to them. And apparently his disciples said, when will you appear to us and when will we see you? And Jesus said, when you strip without being ashamed and you take your clothes and put them under your feet like little children and trample them, then you will see the son of the living one and you will not be afraid. Does that sound like something Jesus would say? I don't think so. Profound, isn't it? It's no wonder that the proponents of these neo-Gnostic beliefs prefer to quote isolated pieces of these books. I want to tell you, if you think anything was hidden from you, go read these books for a laugh, because I had a good laugh when I read the Gospel of Thomas. It's incoherent nonsense. To try and think that Jesus would say rubbish like that is, is a joke. And so, folks, I'm going to leave that uh, at that. So just to, to summarize, bear in mind that when it comes to New Testament, uh, Christians are pretty much agreed. When it comes to the Old Testament, the Catholics do have extra books. They call them deuterocanon. We call them apocryphal. As I say, although they're not scripture, they're not like this rubbish I've been reading to you here. Yeah? And pretty much the same with the books in the Orthodox canon, not canonical, but some of them have value. Some of them have got his, uh, you know, historical value. Um, and uh, as I told you, the book of Enoch got some very interesting stuff in there, despite the fact that it's not part of Scripture. It was quoted by, you know, um, by Jude and by early Christian writers. Um, but as I've pointed out to you, particularly in the New Testament Apocrypha, while there are a few books that were quoted by early Christians and may have limited value and not canonical when you get to the nagamadi stuff you're dealing with utter rubbish that came from heretical cults that were already in the, uh, the second century irenaeus exposed a lot of these cults he's got a book that's called um, against heresies a very long book where he goes into great detail about these guys like the followers of valentinus and all the strange beliefs that the Gnostics has, and he mentions their writings, and he is very authoritative, and a lot of these writings correlate to what we already knew from Irenaeus, although the works were lost. So we haven't got works that have been discovered. They're certainly not like the Dead Sea Scrolls, where we had canonical books, the Book of Enoch and Jubilees discovered. The ones at Nagamadi are all rubbish. That's my summary of this. So read those ones if you want to laugh, if you want to try to get some value out of books that are non-scriptural. They are apocryphal books which have limited value depending on which ones they are.